The conversation around aliens, the Bible, the overflow of the Nephilim, sightings being confirmed by the government itself has caused immense speculation. Have they been here all along? Is there scriptural evidence about aliens and it dating back all the way to the Nephilim? Or is there something more sinister happening? Are there portals and dimensions being opened up that people aren't even aware of in terms of what they're engaging with? This is what we're going to be discussing on today's video. And I, I want you guys to know that this is not stuff to be taken lightly. There's immense debate even within Christian circles about this sort of stuff. Even within the meaning of who are the Nephilim? Are these disembodied spirit hybrids still on earth today? Everyone from the likes of the late great Michael Heiser to biblical YouTube theologians all over the internet. And where is this ultimately all going? Are there going to be more clear and clear encounters that will send even more alarming signals to people who are watching? But before we go there, guys, my name is Ruslan. This channel exists to encourage, empower, and inspire you to live a life that blesses God. If you're new here, if you're not new here, please make sure to hit that subscribe button as many of you who watch this channel, unfortunately, are not subscribed. All right, let's jump into this video. So, so the question is, were the Nephilim wiped out after the flood. Because if you're reading Genesis, what you'll notice is that the sons of God or, or angels come down, they have babies, and then they seem to be wiped out after the flood. Mm -hmm. Some people believe they weren't wiped out. Some people believe that their disembembered spirits, the, 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 the physically they were wiped out, but their spirits are perhaps still on earth. Sus. So this is a faith and fiction podcast. They've been talking a lot about this stuff. To destroy an entire group of people, even their children who are innocent, who didn't even do anything yet. And once you realize this seed war, then you know that the Amorites were actually Nephilim. And it says that their king uh, is the king of Bashan, and his name was Og, or if you're urban, OG. But uh, and so he was... <laughs> You don't know what that means. Just keep going. But he By was. Way, uh, real, real quick, real quick. Let's just let's just give them props for their set. That's a fire set. The yeah. city city uh, background. Got the tinted windows so you could see out the city. Fire. I'm, where, where is that? I gotta I got I gotta come and check out your guys' set. That's fire. This is Texas for sure. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. He was a Nephilim, but he. This is something we have to go into another episode because there's too much. But this tripped me out when I found this out. He was engaging in the practice of creating Nephilim with humans. Like, he was actually what? helping that happen after the flood. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, the flood came and destroyed all of them. Well, right. the flood came because of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we find out that he was doing that again. And so if the Nephilim are found in Scripture after the flood, guess what? They're We're still, still after the yeah. flood in this generation. Why would God... Mm. I, I am so intrigued. I am so curious on how this all works together. Okay, so the people began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. So the sons of God, this is the angels or fallen angels. It's, it's hard to decipher, but this is this is where the origin of the Nephilim comes from, right? Any uh, they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth, for whatever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Then, then that's kind of where you get those uh, Greek mythologies, possibly. Potentially, right? Yeah. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Everything. It says everything they thought and imagined. The, the sequencing is the, this is interesting because it's right after Nephilim, so how much did these hybrids corrupt the human race even more, right? Because you already have the corruption because of the fall. Mm -hmm. How much did it do it even more, right? So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with God. And so we then see the story of Noah. We see the covenant with Noah, subsequently the flood, subsequently the ark, which of course symbolizes what happens in the New Testament with Jesus being the new ark, right? The, 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 the ark that if we're in Christ, we will be protected, 
right? When the Armageddon comes, right? So this is a lot of parallels here, right? In, in, in terms of foreshadowing what we see with the cross. Now, my question is, it sounds like everybody was wiped out. So the solution or the conclusions would be, well, perhaps it wasn't a worldwide flood, or it was a worldwide flood, but maybe their spirit stayed on the earth and was able to demonize and possess other tribes? I, I, I don't know what to make of this. There's an expert on this conversation. He's done extensive work on this regarding uh, just uh, his contributions to the idea of Nephilim and aliens and all that kind of stuff. We've covered him on the channel before. I've noticed that on numerous occasions, Mike says that scripture tells us that the Nephilim were done away with in the Old Testament. Why then are there still instructions that are suggestive of the angels still having potential to be enticed? For instance, if the reference to angels and the head covering harken back to Genesis 6, why is that significant unless cohabitation is still possible? So first and foremost, he's referencing what we just read in, in, in Genesis, Genesis 6. If a woman's hair is covered in the new covenant. Well, I would say first, you know, the, the wording of the question sort of presumes that the watchers and the sons of God and the Nephilim are kind of the same, but they're not. You know, mm. I, I, I think, you know, that the questioner understands that, but the wording, the way the question is worded makes me just wonder a little bit. So I just start there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 obviously doesn't mention Nephilim, but the, the gist of the question is, why was Paul concerned? Well, the, the fact that Paul would be concerned about angelic enticement is mm. no justification for arguing that there are Nephilim now. Uh, mm. it, it just means he was concerned. In other words, it means exactly what you would think it would mean, that, that in Paul's mind, that this, this possibility was there. Okay, A possibility is not an actuality. Mm. And these are just simple simple ways of just thinking coherently about the, the topic we're discussing. They're not instructions that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about the head covering in the sense that Paul's saying, do X, because if you don't do X, then Y will happen. Okay, that, isn't, that isn't the sense that, of what Paul's doing. Rather, Paul's advice shows he's, you know, he's concerned. He, he considers uh, a Genesis 6-like event to you know, perhaps be possible. That doesn't mean it was happening. It doesn't mean it would happen again. Okay, Paul's just reflecting a, a fear or concern, something, again, that's kind of lurking in the back of his mind. Uh, but there, there's no guarantee that if someone who, you know, some woman who listened to Paul and read that and said, well, forget that, I'm leaving my head covered, I'm doing what I want, you know, flaunt my sexuality, that doesn't mean that something's going to happen to her. In other words, it, it sounds like with what Michael Heiser is saying is that the Nephilim and the Watchers are different. Mm -hmm. I don't hear him making an argument for the Nephilim still being on Earth today in this video. Okay, maybe there's other videos where he's making an sure. argument. That is what the original video that we looked at did make an argument for. I think some people take the position that the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood, but their spirits stayed on the earth, and that's where we started getting this other dimension, perhaps demons, perhaps, right? Wow. Uh, because prior to that, did we see demonic activity in Genesis? I don't think we did, with the exception of the serpent oh, that's interesting. in the beginning, yeah. right? So perhaps sons, of, uh, sons of, of God have babies with humans. They're these Nephilites, Nephilim. God wipes them out, but their spirits are still here, and their spirits are now what's roaming the earth in what maybe we consider this demonic realm. Those same spirits become aliens, or what we call aliens today, and the watchers are something else. Uh, is not being taught in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is not teaching a cause-effect reality, okay. and, and in some cases even a potentiality. What it, what it does, what Paul's wording suggests is that in his mind, he thought that there was, you know, some, there's a reason to be concerned. There's some possibility here, but we can't sort of convert that possibility in Paul's head to something that would indeed happen. Possibilities are just that. They are possibilities. They are not actualities. A potentiality is not an actuality. Again, I, we, hmm. could, we could just go over the, again, the, these terms like this to try to draw the distinction, but I think, you know, that would get a little annoying. So I would just say Paul isn't predicting anything. His words reflect a concern of his. There's no evidence from, from the fact that he was concerned that anything was happening. The Old Testament does make it quite clear that the, that the, the giant clan lines were destroyed. You know, that, that's, that's the whole point mm. of what happens with the Rephaim, the, the remnant there, you know, flees mm -hmm. to the cities of the Philistines. That's where we find mm -hmm. them next. Goliath and his brothers are taken out. They're exterminated. Mm -hmm. We never get another reference to them. Uh, even if you're reading the Septuagint, you have a reference to Enochim in Jeremiah, but it's a reference back to the Philistines. You know, there's just no evidence for this. Zero in Scripture that we have a Nephilim presence okay, beyond the Old Testament period, on into the intertestamental period, on into the New Testament. All we can say is that from the way Paul wrote this, he thought that it, it could happen again. In other words, there's nothing in his mind that says it can't happen again, mm. but we can't convert that to saying, oh, it was, or it is. Or if mm. somebody just you know, flaunted you know, their sexuality, some woman in Corinth, that, that it was going to happen. That was the trigger event. 
you know, it's going to produce this, this effect. This is the cause that produces this effect. All of those things are overstatements. They overstate the data. So I don't think we should read into what Paul said. We should just sort of leave it where Paul left it. Interesting. So Michael Heiser's position here is that the Nephilim physically weren't around. Mm. But if you want to hear him go deeper on this and how he connects this exact conversation to the topic of aliens, we'll have this pinned over here for you. All right? I'll see you over there. Peace. One of my favorite passages is in Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul writes that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of this unseen world. I could spook a lot of people out because there is a spiritual world and there is a spiritual war. But what I love about that passage is he tells us to therefore put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the gospel of peace. And that is the inspiration for our latest collection, the Armor of God collection, but a custom cut and sew Armor of God jacket representing all the different patches that reflect the Armor of God. Available for a limited time only, so go to blessgod.shop to get yours now.